Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. This is Steve Sir Heinrich with Curvo, and it's a pleasure to have you on this call. Today, we're going to be talking about interventional radiology. I know people are still um, getting logged in and they're still getting the, the zoom up on their computers, but we're going to go ahead and get going because we do want to try to make this within 30 minutes. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things just to let you know. Uh, this is being recorded. So if you have any, uh, if you'd like to see this again, you will get a, a recording of it. And I want to encourage you to ask questions. We will monitor the questions as, um, as they're asked. And there's a Q&A button on the Zoom panel. You should be able to see that on the bottom. You just hit that Q&A panel and you can ask a question. You can also chat. If you want to do that, that's fine too. There's a chat window where everybody can see it. That's been pretty effective in the past if someone chats there and you can answer uh, kind of get feedback from the the attendees as well so feel free to use either one the q a or the chat and if questions come up during we'll try to address them uh, during the uh, presentation but we'll mm -hmm. definitely take time at the end all right i'm going to introduce andy perry now he's the ceo and founder of curvo and he will take it from here andy go ahead great thanks steve and then you know if you are using the uh, q a or the chat just ask uh, no heckling of the hosts or the panel members that uh, my confidence is easily shaken, so I can't be uh, steered off in any way. But uh, just like Steve said, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm excited to dig into this topic. I don't know if any of you have ever um, followed around a, a physician in the cath lab or observed cases, uh, IR lab or cath lab, but it, it's a lot of fun, frankly, <laughs> watching these ladies and gentlemen that are, are uh, almost like mechanics of the vasculature, watching them uh, do their work and, uh, you know, even more importantly, do things to relieve suffering for patients and save limbs and pretty cool area for us to explore today. So first of all, I'd just like to uh, uh, give a little bit of a overview on the Curvo Quick 30 premise. Um, you know, what we like to do with these is take a clinician perspective. Uh, we like to give a sourcing perspective. And then uh, today we're doing something really special. We're treated with a material scientist, a PhD, who is very skilled and knowledge in the peripheral vascular space. And so I'll make his introduction in just a moment. So we're adding a little product perspective today uh, as well. So I'm your host. I'm Andy Perry, co-founder and CEO at Curvo. Um, as has been our typical format, you know, sometimes we've had uh, physicians live for these. Other times we just do a questionnaire and we go over those results. Uh, so we've got a questionnaire completed today by Dr. Philip Orens, uh, Chief of Radiology at UPMC. So really excited to get that perspective. Um, as I mentioned before, we're joined by Dr. Randy Shearer. He's Chief Scientific Officer at Kirkwood Shearer Capital Ventures, um, with also a long track record in the, the medical device industry as well. Um, now with that lovely pick of uh, Randy and his family, I'll leave it to the audience to determine which one is Randy. But uh, also got Drew Mays for our sourcing perspective, your uh, uh, friendly and well-known to most of you as customers, uh, Director of Customer Success here at Curbo. So he's going to color our perspective with a little bit of market data and insights of what we're seeing going on in the customer base. So in absentia, Dr. Orens, thank you. Randy, thank you. Drew, thank you. All right, let's get right to it. Dr. Orens, Professor of Radiology at UPMC. Chief of Interventional Radiology, co-author of many scientific papers, book chapters, monographs, and presentations, uh, grad school at Drexel, medical school at Philadelphia, and fellowship trained. So a guy with a unique perspective. And as many of you know, UPMC has got a great reputation around sourcing and value analysis, really uh, done some of the, the leading and innovative things in the industry over the years. So great to, to have this. Um, Dr. Randy Shearer, again, Chief Scientific Officer at Kirkwood Shearer Capital, uh, former senior project manager at DECRA. So he got a front row seat to uh, the regulatory space uh, when it comes to uh, peripheral vascular devices, former regulatory scientist at Cook Medical prior to that, and he's a Vanderbilt alum. So those of you in the SEC, uh, you know, either hold it against him or don't hold it against him, depending on your school allegiances. Uh, but uh, just a, a extremely smart and talented, knowledgeable individual in this space. So we're very fortunate to, to have Randy join us. 
Um, so what I'm going to do in this format is we're going to go over uh, Dr. Oren's perspective. And you know, one of our goals with this is to really help in the supply chain, help us understand how our doctors are learning about new devices, learning what devices cost, um, and you know, who's really that source of truth or information for the clinician, how interested are they in it, where are they seeing changes, and we're going to take some of Dr. Warren's answers and just bounce them up against uh, Randy um, and against Drew as well to, to get any insights we can out of it. So the first thing we always ask is how often do you look at new products? We want to get a sense of, of really when they're checking the market and what those mechanisms are. And so Dr. Warren's is saying it's fairly often um, that he's taken at least monthly uh, meetings from vendors where he's looking at products. But, you know, again, this and this is for some of you, it's 101, and for some of you, it's new information. But the conferences and the professional associations are such a source of um, new product learning. You know, it's where the device companies launch their products. Um, it's where they can really capture the captive audience uh, of the physicians and, and surgeons, practitioners. Um, and so, you know, really, if, if you've got a category manager um, in your supply chain organization, dedicated to cath lab and IR, really important to understand when those conference dates are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if not attending on your own, um, be very briefed of, of what's going on in those conferences and what some of the trends are, what are some of the launches that are happening in concert with those conferences, uh, because that will keep you in lockstep with your um, physicians. Uh, Randy, Drew, any surprises there? No, not from the sourcing perspective, but yep. that seems to be the trend on most of these categories that we review that doctors are really learning from the conferences in these specialized groups. Mm -hmm. Randy, any one of the surprises that I see actually is in question number three, that, uh, that the physician actually refers to the IFU whenever it comes with the devices. So. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. A little something you'd know a little bit about, I guess, there, Randy. Um, yeah, usually, usually they, uh, they understand how the thing works and, you know, they go right into it. Right. <laughs> now, the, the IFUs, and you mentioned it, it's great. That those are a rich source of information yeah. educationally for a supply chain professional. If you get into those IFUs, they, are, they have to be public information. They're required as part of the FDA um, regulations. And Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you can find those um, on the device company's websites, and it can really help you get up to speed on the use cases for the products and indications and, and also just on the category in general. Um, yeah, and that, that information is uh, what was utilized to gain the regulatory approvals in the different regions around the world. Otherwise, it can't be in the IFU. Yeah, and I think this is the first one that we've done where the physician mentions the yeah. IFU as a as a major criteria in guiding evaluation. That, that's cool. That's a good insight. And you, know, I mean, it's interesting. Perhaps UPMC is doing something to tee up that information uh, to Dr. Orens. You know, he he can, in later uh, questions talks about his role in the value analysis committee. But it is interesting that in researching alternative products or looking at new products. You know, we're consistently, this, the hospital supply chain is not in the conversation. Correct. They're not learning Correct. about new products from the hospital yeah. supply chain. Seldom are they learning what the device costs from yeah. the hospital supply yeah. chain. A little bit different here with Dr. Orens on the cost side of it, but still, uh, you know, we're not out in front as yeah. the supply chain right. in helping to, uh, educate our, our uh, medical staff on new products and what's coming out. It's, yeah. it's much more reactive yeah. on our side, yeah. unfortunately. Any thoughts or uh, reactions there, uh, Randy or Drew? I would just say that we see it common that uh, we get requests or uh, item lookups from customers of new products. So that's the reactive doctor has brought product A, now they need to figure out how much it costs right. before they can implement it into their, their organization. So mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree that it's very rare that the supply chain is leading or investigating newer, maybe cheaper products or mm -hmm. more efficient products. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. So. Yeah, I mean, it's really two things. It's, it, you have within many supply chains, of course, there's going to be a, a, a reticence or a hesitance to um, you know, proactively suggest new devices yeah. to use. It's almost like a nightmare scenario for most of us. But there's the other side of the coin of the supply chain really 
not being viewed as a credible source of authority or information yeah. for this yeah. stuff. You know, it, it's, it's a, almost a positioning branding relationship thing. That's a real opportunity we have with our medical mm-hmm. staff, of course, on the cost side, we know that. Yeah. We know that our, our clinical staff members in general, most of our hospitals are not finding out about a device cost from the supply chain. Mm-hmm. And that's a big black eye for us and a real opportunity for us. But even to be able to be viewed as a trusted partner um, for information about new devices and educating our surgeons on how they compare to what they're using, what the clinical value proposition is. Um, I don't know, Randy, any, any experience there or thoughts? I mean, is it almost comical to think of the supply chain as that source of information or are there uh, uh, some real opportunities there? No, I think there's some real opportunities for you guys to think of it from that particular perspective. Um, but primarily, you know, whenever you think of the medical device companies, their their customer isn't the supply chain, it's the physician. And especially when you're talking about more advanced devices with competition in the space, they aren't going to try and convince, um, you know, the the supply chain because they're probably not at the SIR and, and guest meetings. Uh, they're there to convince the physician on a, you know, an efficacy standpoint or mm-hmm. some advantage of their product uh, that will drive them to then bring that back to the hospital to want to use mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yep. No, very, very good. Um, we'll do a little bit of uh, just kind of summary of a few of these questions. So um, scientific data is most important to Dr. Orange. Um, he does look at the IFUs, which we said was interesting. Um, they do rely on the reps. Uh, taking some of it with a grain of salt or a lot of it with a grain of salt, um, looking for uh, anything peer reviewed uh, that's coming from the reps, of course, to help give it that level of steam, but still looking at it, still taking it, even if it's with a grain of salt, relying on on scientific data that the reps are providing or studies that the reps are providing, like it's an influential source, whether whether we put that mental discount on it or not, it's still a source of information that's being used to make device decisions even from somebody who is, you know, fairly uh, intellectually rigorous, I would say, or or, uh, determined to be objective like this gentleman. Um, It's still there, that flow uh, is still happening. Now on the cost side, um, Dr. Orange is saying he doesn't have anything to do with establishing the cost up front. I think that's really what he has, um, uh, what he's trying to get at here, that he is deferring completely to UPMC supply chain Um, for their contracts and for their discipline practices Mm -hmm. and what they'll pay for a particular device. That's the way I view this is um, because he gets later on, he he establishes a cost is extremely important to him. But what he's saying is I'm not going to get in the middle on this stuff up front. Uh, I leave that to them. I care about what the device costs. I'm going to take that into consideration on whether I use something. But uh, if if somebody's trying to get a product, then they need to go talk to supply chain to figure out the price. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think he's trusting his supply chain staff to go get the best price right. for that product, uh, but he's willing to listen if the product seems to be yeah. a little egregious on the price. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. So I yeah. think it's common. Yeah. So, so he and his supply chain are basically saying, you do you, yep. I'll do me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we're going to work together and, yeah. and uh, come up with the, the best thing. <laughs> and as an academic medical center, you know, there, I'm sure there's some uh, research obligations and needs and, and training young clinicians on uh, multiple products and, and uh, methods. So uh, it, it is really interesting to hear though, cost effectiveness is paramount. You know, the system is mm-hmm. willing to pay a premium for unique devices. They'd better be really unique to serve a purpose that can't be substituted. Um, you know, they've moved to a limited number of vendors for devices like balloons and stents. If there are certain covered stints that are only made by a single manufacturer, have no good altern- alternatives. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of, of uh, being judicious there. Yeah. Um, now I think we're going to be able to get into uh, a little bit of, of Randy's area of expertise. And um, so I'm going to skip on down to uh, right now. And th- these slides will all be available for you if you want to uh, uh, further parse them and, and drill in. But um, we ask in number eight, what products are you not willing to switch? And he's saying it's a hard one because there are certain procedures that require very specific project, uh, products. He mentions the TIPS procedure and certain types of embolization. 
with very specific tools, um, but he really can't think of a product he wouldn't be willing to consider changing if there was a satisfactory alternative. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say this is a pretty common perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, if something is off limits, or at least what the surgeon is verbalizing to us in these surveys, if a, if a product is off limits, it's because they don't know of a satisfactory alternative. Agreed. That's the deal. Yeah. So here's that other gap, an yeah. opportunity for us in supply chain is to, to be on top of the market mm -hmm. and to be proactive in having all the detailed knowledge and information about alternatives that could be satisfactory yeah. and what's coming out and not doing it with an agenda with our surgeons, but being that trusted source mm -hmm. of information. Randy, what are you seeing really as uh, some of the more differentiated things that are out there in the marketplace now? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever you're talking about the more advanced type procedures, such as, as tips that he even mentions here, uh, it, it's really going to be driven a lot by what that physician was trained on. A lot of these medical device companies uh, hold, you know, big symposiums and training workshops for these physicians earlier in their residency stages, and then they kind of continue pushing that product on them um, throughout, you know, their initiation into more of a clinical practice. So, you know, once they've used it, uh, it becomes that matter of personal preference, which you actually see in his response in question number nine. Um, you know, they, they use it because it is their preference. It's what they've used their entire career, what they trained on. So, you know, that that's kind of the, the trend that we've seen from uh, medical device companies and trying to, you know, catch a physician early in his career to, to train them on the advanced procedures. Mm -hmm. And there's always, you know, novel products that come out in, in the interventional radiology space because it is such a, a exciting and multifaceted treatment area. Um, even embolization, you've got uh, drug drug loadable spheres that came out uh, a couple years ago, and then you've now got uh, degradable drug loadable spheres that are in development. Um, so, you know, those type of things are, are the next edge that companies are looking at uh, from a product perspective where they're trying to create the differentiation he's talking about for it to be adopted by the community. Mm. Mm. So, some things to be aware of, particularly it sounds like, are in the embolization space. Yeah. That's where a lot of the uh, maybe new product inner, uh, innovation or differentiation is coming. So um, for all our supply chain team members out there, just kind of have your, your radar up and think about what your strategy is going to be around these embolization products and how you might want to uh, uh, take a sourcing strategy according to um, that particular category. And then tips as well. You know, I'm not as familiar with um, the tips process, but um, I think that is for cirrhosis of the liver, I believe. And it's essentially relieving uh, um, hypertension <laughs> in the right. vein in the liver that's making backflow, but Randy, you want to elaborate on that for us a little more? No, I mean, you, you nailed it there. They're essentially trying to uh, bridge different regions of the liver with, you know, covered, ch covered stents um, mm -hmm. to reduce that pressure. And, um, you know, it is a complicated procedure, which, you know, um, requires a lot of expertise on. So uh, again, I think that goes back to why, you know, he, he, he used that as his example, because once you've, you've been trained on something, um, you know, in a complex procedure like that, it's going to take a lot for you to shift to something new um, mm -hmm. without a significant advantage. Right. Yeah. Right. Now it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, it might be a, a lower volume area for um, many of our listeners, or, or if you're a large destination referral center, it might be something to, to really be thinking about, but your hands might be tied from a sourcing perspective yeah. there. And there might be good reasons. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> might be some very good reasons. there. Um, now, as we go on to question nine, uh, we ask what products are you willing to consider alternatives because the technology is all the same? And he's saying almost all of them, and he's verbalized that above. Um, you know, if he, if he isn't willing to consider, it's, or, or there isn't anything that he's not willing to consider, it's just there may be areas where he doesn't know of a good alternative or there may not be one. Um, but if we're looking at kind of splitting out from a sourcing perspective, uh, products that he sees are most similar and interchangeable, guide wires, obviously, introduction, uh, introduction sheets, and access sets. So a lot of those um, access commodities and the sheets and guide wires, some subtle but important differences between catheters, so he's not really willing to put them in that same category, uh, but conceding that much of it is personal preference. Um, 
Randy, how much do you see the device companies trying to differentiate in sheaths, guide wires, and access sets? Um, does it jive with uh, what Dr. Orens is saying, or are there some attempts um, in the marketplace by device companies to really stand alone in those more commodity areas? Yeah, I mean, I think there there are a few um, you know differentiators that that you see in uh, guide sets but you know one of the points we're going to talk about here in a minute I think is the, uh, the evolution of new procedures for IR and mm -hmm. and that's really tibia pedal access um, so we can talk about that a little bit later here um, which kind of drives a little bit of the development of those interchangeable parts uh, to smaller sizes uh, yeah. but with with catheters I mean you do see a, a, a big driver there you know you've got steerable catheters you got different types of reinforcements on those catheters, coated catheters, antimicrobial coated catheters. So there are very uh, distinct differences um, for the different types of use usage that those physicians are targeting and, you know, what advantages those products bring to, you know, reduction of bloodstream infections within the hospital, um, you know, ability to, to access different regions of the body for delivery of embolization spheres or coils. Um, you know, it, it very, very much does come down to, uh, um, you know, the advantage of that product and, you know, what, what that physician's preference is. Yeah, no, that, that's good. I appreciate those insights. I think that's a great segue, Randy, into some of the market perspective or product perspective um, elements that uh, you're seeing. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and, and keep that baton and, and maybe elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, so um, with with the access devices that I was was speaking of, um, you know, one of the procedures for uh, critical limb ischemia and trying to to pass through a lesion to you know either do balloon angioplasty or place a stent, um, you know, arthrectomy, uh, they do a femoral approach, uh, trying to come down from the top, uh, uh, anterograde uh, to cross that lesion. Uh, but over the years, uh, at least the last few years, they've developed smaller size micropuncture introducer sets for uh, retrotibial uh, pedal access. So they're coming from the, the retrograde approach bottom up from the foot. And those lesions are actually softer uh, and able to be crossed by uh, devices and, and you know, saves actually limbs pretty s substantially in the publications that you've seen in that particular space. Uh, from amputation uh, type procedures that would be required. So it's kind of a, you know, an advancement and really shifted uh, those interchangeable devices that were mentioned a minute ago, the guide wires and the microcatheters and the access products to, to smaller sizes so they could, uh, so they could, you know, save patients uh, limbs. And right. that really provided a significant advantage, I think, uh, in the, in the treatment realm for IR and, you know, peripheral intervention type right. approaches. Yeah. So just kind of to recap there, one major theme is, would be in those more commoditized product areas, the access devices for the introducers and the sheaths and the guide wires. Um, you know, it's not so much a, a new treatment technology, but for those deep PADs, uh, you know, below the knee, um, really taking that different method to go through the foot instead of through the femoral artery catch that lesion from the backside mm -hmm. where softer or more penetrable and more easily treated, um, you know, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's so cool because this is, this is what's great about this space is you're saving limbs. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Think about it, just mission related, you know, and, and this is such a clinical win too. Yeah. And I think Drew's got some data. You might just want to share. Drew, do you see any cost differences in the marketplace? between that uh, uh, pedal approach through the foot or the femoral approach, uh, kind of the, the differences in the French sizes, is, is there much cost difference in the marketplace? Yeah, the pedal approach is the, the access kits or the introducer kits are on average 10 to $15 cheaper uh, for the, the introducer sets. Mm -hmm. uh, the catheters, and there's not a, a big variation based on the French size, uh, 2.3 to five or anything but definitely some savings there especially if you have a high volume that you're using of the more of the commoditized items there's some some decent savings to be had there so interesting so even cheaper to do the pedal approach from a supply perspective yeah. i mean if, if 
minimally or, or yeah. marginally yeah. cheaper. Um, but then, uh, you know, so much better potential clinical yeah. result based on what yeah. these are kind of wins we're searching for in yep. supply chain. Yep. You know, if it's if it's cost neutral, if it's cost reductive, and increasing quality, then man, that's that's the thing we got to be all over all day long. Yep. So pretty cool. You know, yep. <laughs> there there's a chance for us to go out and get a win in supply chain. Yep. Um, work with our, our medical staff and do that. But what I think is most interesting about this space is there are so many ways that the practice patterns can vary mm -hmm. to treat the patient. You yeah. know? <laughs> and Randy, I think this is going to lead into to your next bullet, really. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so one of the trends that uh, we were seeing, you know, after 2017, there was uh, um, you know, some products that were removed from the market, uh, Abbott's uh, degradable uh, stent for coronary treatment. And, um, you know, Boston Scientific also decided to really halt um, their product because there were, you know, the long-term studies really showed there wasn't any superiority or benefit to um, those, those products being utilized. And uh, that really stunted and really slowed down any potential development of biodegradables for peripheral use, which would be, you know, more along the lines of, of the interventional radiologist, uh, you know, doing, doing those types of procedures in the limbs. Um, so we've seen more increased development of, of drug-coated balloons and uh, drug-coated stents uh, for these procedures. And, you know, they, they've done a fantastic job of, of you know, evaluating all those new products clinically and uh, in clinical studies to, to show the advantages of um, drug-coated stents versus drug-coated balloons. But as those technologies continue to develop, um, you know, it's just going to be even better for the physicians, uh, you know, long-term uh, for the patients as well and how they respond. Mm -hmm. Drew, what are you seeing in the market uh, in data as far as the use of coated balloons? Yeah, we're definitely seeing a, a tick up uh, in the coated balloons over the past, you know, 12 months or so. Uh, we've seen utilization from our hospitals that are, are indicating that that's the shift. That, mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, they're using more of those uh, coated balloons. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then as far as pricing, so utilization going up kind of. Uh, loosely across the market, what's the pricing doing in coated balloons right now? There's a little tick up, but it's it's pretty level. There's no major increases in price. Uh, could change as the utilization stables itself and mm -hmm. or you know continues to grow, and they realize they they got their hooks in, mm -hmm. and the uh, practice is there to be had. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty much level as far as uh, the pricing goes. And then what kind of price ranges are we seeing for drug-coated balloons? In the uh, anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 for a, a peripheral drug a drug looting stent. Uh, right. For a coated balloon. Coated, low, coated balloon. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the low-end low 1600 uh, I mean the high-end 1600 low-end 1300 uh, The cutting balloons, low-end 700 or high-end 700 low-end 650 So not a big variation, but definitely one of the – more cost efficient to use the, the cutting if, if uh, applicable also. Oh, if, yes. if, yeah. But yeah. so we're definitely seeing in the data validation of, uh, you know, increased usage and even a little bit of increased price pressure when it comes to yeah. drug coated balloons. Yeah. Yeah. So something yeah. to, to be aware of for sure. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. And Randy, your, your last bullet on some of the um, market trends that you're seeing movement toward detachable embolization coils. Yeah. So, I mean, over the last, three to five years, uh, there's been a, a shift in, you know, physician preference for uh, detachable embolization products as opposed to pushable coils. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and part of that, I think, goes to, um, you know, what they've been trained on. So the newer uh, products that were out on the market, the interlocks from Boston Scientific, the retracted products from Cook, um, you know, they, they allow for uh, placement of those coils and then if you don't like where that coil is placed you can obviously pull it right back and mm -hmm. uh, you know that provides a significant advantage for uh, you know complex procedures again from a, a physician perspective so mm -hmm. uh, those those started taking over um, the market share from from the pushable coils which have been around for you know <laughs> since the early 70s probably even earlier than that uh, <laughs> um, uh, but that is one of the trends that we've seen. And then also, um, you know, controlled delivery of, 
uh, PVA particles or embolization spheres uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, catheters that, that have flares on them to prevent reflux um, mm -hmm. and, not, and, and, and non, you know, off-target embolization. So embolization occurring where you don't want it to occur whenever you're delivering those products. Right. Gotcha. Oh. Any idea on the incidence of, of uh, aneurysm or I guess embolization needs in the marketplace? I really have no clue. In something. terms, of, in terms of volume, or, or yeah, we'd be expecting procedure volume to kind of be stable or increase, or are these new devices even opening up previously untreatable conditions? Do you have any read there? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the embolization space, uh, you know, with coils is probably um, you know going to be pretty stable in terms of of growth. You'll see continued increased growth due to you know obviously increase in in the number of treatable patients in the world. Um, mm -hmm. However, whenever you start thinking of uh, embolization, you know, particles or spheres, uh, there's been procedural advancement that's, that's occurred over the last three to five years with, uh, you know, particles being used for uh, benign prostate hyperplasia, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, um, you know, classically treated by a urologist with uh, TERP, which is transurethral resection of the prostate, mm -hmm. uh, but they've, you know, tried to pioneer uh, utilization of embolization spheres to shrink the prostate from, you know, the blockage of blood flow and uh, necrosis perspective. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other space that I think you see a lot of growth with embolization particles is, is within the um, treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, um, you know, for trying to target some of those, uh, those liver, you know, metastases. Mm -hmm. and, and so the disease. Yeah. yeah. So you, you've seen, you've seen a shift and probably we'll continue to see an increased shift in growth of uh, embolization spheres in, in that area, um, you know, with, with different drugs uh, loaded on them to help uh, maybe bridge that patient to transplant. Gotcha. No, that's extremely insightful and, you know, corroborated. We've got Dr. Oren saying, hey, this is a space where there are some really unique devices. Yeah. And we've got Randy saying these unique devices are also usurping some previous treatments and therapies for them. So in our supply chains, let's, let's really uh, be mindful of this and keep an eye, eye out for what we're doing in our category and uh, uh, sourcing strategy around embolization products. So mm -hmm. extremely helpful. Yeah, good, good stuff. You know, the, the problem with this being a quick 30 is that our 30 is up. Like, this is such an interesting category. It's really fascinating. If you haven't studied this space, if you haven't observed any cases out there in the audience, I really encourage you to do that. Um, we're at the end of our 30, so we do want to leave time for questions. Steve, I'm going to turn it back over to you um, and let you uh, field any, any questions that we've got. We're happy to stay on for a few more minutes and, and field those. Okay, just getting off mute. Um, yeah, anybody who's still on, feel free to go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A or in the chat. But one, I believe, more for Randy is just um, the categories that you would, you would, the product categories that you would lump into interventional radiology. What, what are those? Oh, man, everything. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a big space. I mean, because you've got you've got interventionalists that are that are also placing, you know, feeding tubes, um, you know, um, you've got all the way from, you know, the vascular access uh, type treatment products to, you know, the stents, the covered stents, uh, embolization products. Uh, They'll I mean, even do life ablations and kyphoplasties yeah, sometimes. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it is such a, a large, large space. I know we kind of talked about that briefly yesterday. I was trying to get a, a reading on, you know, where we wanted to go with this because it is such a, a large space in terms of, of product families that, that can be grouped into IR. Okay. That's good. Thanks for answering that. And that's the, oh, here we have another question. Um, so in the arthrectomy market, many products appear to be customized to different types of plaques. That may be more of a statement than a question. I, I think Randy can expound on that for sure. Like, Randy, what, what's your level of familiarity of the arthrectomy device being um, specific to the type of plaque? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Um, 
there are different uh, types of atherectomy devices that would be used in, in different situations. Um, and again, I think it, it's going to go back to uh, also some of that physician's training on, on those particular types of products, what they, what they prefer. Um, you know, there, there haven't been uh, too many studies that have differentiated the, um, the atherectomy products, you know, from uh, um, you know, rotational type products to, you know, uh, laser products or, or ultrasound um, breakage. But, um, you know, I, I can agree. I, I, I think that they are probably uh, associated with better performance in different types of plaques. Uh, but it, 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 from what I've seen, I think it, it goes a lot back to the physician preference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just it. The, the practice patterns can be so varied. I mean, for the same lesion, lesion, you could, and correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but you could use an atherectomy device or you could go in with one of those little true paths and bore a hole mm-hmm. in the lesion and then go in with a, a cutting balloon and then go in with a stent. I mean, exactly. <laughs> just, there could be so much variation or you could not do that at all and just bypass the lesion, right? And yep. do a, a graft. So. Yep. It is. There, there are so many different different ways to, to treat these uh, patients, which you know sometimes is is a is a great thing, but also can be challenging. From I'm I'm sure uh, from a uh, uh, operations standpoint, and you know making sure you've got the the products that are necessary and and actually perform the best because of the multiple types of approaches to treat a lesion. Um, you know, it is difficult to differentiate from the clinical data that's out there what is the best approach because it's just not it's not standardized across the across the interventional community. Yeah. Right. Well, this is a good lead into our next chat question, which is yeah. um, which is the what's the best way to approach IR physicians on standardization of products? My answer to that would be good, detailed cost and utilization case level analytics, like mm. peer comparative, you know, <laughs> surgeon one, surgeon two, I like putting their names on it, but show if, if we stratify it and we just look at PADs, so you look at those, um, those peripheral arterial disease blockages, and that's what you're talking about, and you look at the different case level cost and utilization comparisons across your surgeons, and you just put that data in front of them. Mm-hmm. You're not coming with any presupposition of an idea or foisting a new product on them. Begin to share those case level cost and utilization analyses. I think that's the best way. Um, Randy, you know, coming from a, a device company background, if you're trying to, to move practitioners in a common direction, any suggestions there? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to kind of the point that I make on on the clinical data. Um, You know, you'll see a lot of, of, you know, post-marketing studies on these products because most of them don't require a a clinical trial to get to market when you're talking about the standard products, the the guide wires, the catheters, the uh, access devices. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, with the tibial pedal procedure to convince a physician that it was a good approach, uh, they needed to do a post-market study on that particular product to show the advantages because, you know, they've been classically trained on the integrate approach mm-hmm. and, um, you know, they believed in that and didn't think that this was something that could be done. So, the, you know, the device companies had to provide the, the clinical data to support transition to that procedure, um, you know, whenever it, it, it did provide advantages. So, In this space, if it's a product that doesn't require a clinical study before it comes to market, uh, you're going to see those post-market studies that are going to help drive the the data and information for a physician to want to adopt a product. Uh, If it's a product that does require, you know, uh, a preclinical study uh, before approval, then, um, you know, you're going to see a comparison probably to... um, you know, the, the, uh, the top competitor on the market, or at least something that is comparable competitor to, to what you're seeing in the space to either show non-inferiority or superiority. And, and then if it shows superiority, well, then they've got the marketing gold that they can go out and really transition a, a space over to, to utilization of their product. Well, I think that's a great insight to answer that question around standardization is you have some really rich data sources through the regulatory approval path mm-hmm. that can help you tee your clinicians up 
um, with how to make those decisions. So if it's if it's something that's coming through on a 510K and there's a you know substantially yeah. equivalent device showing that information and stratifying your product mix that way to help elicit some standardization from your your doctors, but then you know, mining those post-market studies and putting those in front of those ladies and gentlemen to help mm-hmm. them decide, you know, really on, on these devices that are claimed to be differentiated, mm-hmm. what's the post-market study really showing? Yeah. I think that's extremely insightful as good methods. You know, again, it's, it's about in the supply chain, being the strategic leader who's Im- embedding the right tools and analytics and people resources in an interdisciplinary team that's helping your clinicians make the best value decisions for your mm-hmm. patients. It's not about foisting a product. It's not about being the gatekeeper. Yeah. Uh, Drew, is that consistent with what you see in good leadership in our customer base? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the, anytime you foist something on a physician, it normally ends bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it's uh, finagling those conversations to get their input. So it's an open-ended statement or an open-ended request like, what do you think? Mm-hmm. You know, here's a new product here. You know, we're using three of these and two of these. Tell me the differences, really engage them on the clinical side. But you know, anytime you, you, you're demanding a change, you're going to give a lot of fight. And I know who will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's best to give them the tools to take the baton and become yeah. your advocate yeah. in making good decisions. And sharing yeah. that, that cost data too. That's Definitely. the biggest thing we've yeah. noticed. Uh, They're hungry for it. Yeah, they, they want it. Uh, and they'll tell you why they pay, you should pay more for that or why we shouldn't be paying more for that. So, uh, so yeah, I would agree. That's good. Yeah, That's great. We do, we do have another question, guys. Um, so this one is thoughts on off-label usage of billinary stents. And the question mm-hmm. is, are you seeing them used in peripheral vessels? Randy, what are your thoughts on biliary stents being used in? Off-rate? Can I plead? The, can I plead the fifth? I don't like. I don't like answering those questions. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a former regulator, I don't like it. <laughs> off label, but, I, but I know. I mean, I, I'll I'll address it here, just kind of in a roundabout way. Um, yes, um, I have. I have seen it and have seen transitions. Um, you know, from from. Um, actually uh, both ways um you know some of these drug coated peripheral stents uh have been considered for usage in 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 the biliary space um mm. as well um so i i i say yes that it, it occurs but it's it's physician preference it's always been um you know the medical device community and regulatory communities perspective that uh, you know, a product is approved for a procedure. Uh, mm-hmm. It's demonstrated that it's been safe and effective in that procedure. Um, you know, we, we don't control how a physician chooses to utilize that product in, in a different space um, because that can prohibit uh, innovation, um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for patients. Um, but I also see the flip side where, you know, if a product is used off-label, um, you know, it does bring some risk to uh, the physician and, and the hospital that would be uh, you know, allowing that to occur, I guess. So, um, you know, those are a roundabout way of answering it. But uh, my thoughts are, you know, predominantly on the, you know, you, you don't want to stifle innovation because it could save a patient's life. Um, but well, I, I also see the regulatory risks associated with it. You know, I'm curious, is it, is there any, um, path of least resistance? Is it more common for the device company to get a peripheral stent approved and then go back and get a biliary indication later? Or is it easier to go the other way? I mean, any, any insights there at all? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, it's going to come down to yes. What is the the easiest regulatory pathway to gain approval? Uh, for that product. Um, and then, you know, obviously you want to see adoption of that product in the space that you've gained approval. Uh, mm-hmm. But there is a, some strategy around, you know, if, if that product has potential to be utilized in, in other areas, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you can monitor where that, <laughs> excuse me, where that product is, is being utilized from a, a volume perspective as a medical device company. And know that uh, you may have some advantages if you were to transition to a, a different indication uh, that mm-hmm. would allow you to market specifically to um, to that type of treatment. Gotcha. Um, 
but uh, in terms of in terms of the medical device community's view, they're wanting to get uh, they're wanting to get the product to market as quickly as they can. So they're going to take the path of, of least resistance and then potentially adopt it for other areas. Yeah, no, oh, for sure. And you know how that translates into your sourcing strategies and your spin visibility. Mm-hmm. You, you might want to be aware that if you're pulling based on GMD encodes or something like yeah. that, you, yeah. you don't want to overlook those biliary stents that might truthfully be yeah. used differently or peripheral stents that might be used in a, in a biliary application. So very, uh, very good question by the audience member there. Um, you know, th- this has been outstanding. Randy, I can't thank you enough. I know Steve's going to kind of do our closing, but I just want to personally tell you uh, how much we appreciate your joining us. Um, yeah, glad, glad to join you guys. Great organization, good people, and love what you're doing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, man. Steve? Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And thanks, Drew and Randy. So just to wrap things up, again, this was recorded. So we will be sending you the uh, recording. And there are future quick 30s coming up. Hopefully, we'll keep them within 30 minutes, but you never know. Uh, Total Joints is next. Um, Stan Mendenhall is going to join us along with Bruce Cavanaugh from uh, New Hanover Hospital to talk about those categories. And then we'll be filling in some of the others um, over the next several months and you'll see uh, some calendar updates or some invite updates around that as well. So hopefully you'll join us. Um, If any of you have any uh, experience in some of these categories that you'd like to share and be that sourcing perspective, we'd love to have you on and um, talk with you about this. So please let me know. You can find me at steve at curvolabs.com and um, that would be great to have you participate. And that's it. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks for joining. Thanks, Steve. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy.